Good morning. This is a meeting of the Discipline Subcommittee of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. I'd like to start by taking roll. I've been advised that uh, Sharon Bashan is not going to attend. Um, Falmouth? Here. Kirkmeyer? Here. Byro? Here. Great. Um, thank you. And I want to welcome Danny and Lee, and thank you for joining us once again. We really appreciate your expertise. And I want to go ahead and share um, this the document that Leah sent. It's just her notes from our uh, earlier conversations. So let me bring that up. Um, and then um, I think uh, get more input from Danny and sort of get the discussion going. So can everybody see these notes that are up now? Kind of small. I yeah. Can, okay, I let can me make it bigger. There. Sorry about that. Hang on. Hang on a second. Is that a little bit easier? Yep. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So I think that where we are now is just let's let's take a minute to review this and see if we have any uh, questions and confirm that this is accurate, the information that we have. I want to just take a moment to read it. And um, <laughs> we have this, and then I wanna also refer to um, the document that Leah had sent <clears throat> that sort of listed the different options for uh, whether uh, records would be public. So, but first of all, do we, does anybody have any questions? Well, I have a um, yeah. Linda, can you email these two documents to us? Uh, some of us, yes. uh, we got two screens, we can put them up bigger. Yeah. Hang on a second. Let me, let me do that. I'm just trying to find. Okay. I will send these both to you right now. So, and, um, and, and then I'll also share this other document. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to manage multiple things at once. Sorry, that took a moment. 
Oh, and I want to, let's just double check to see if there's any um, public comment, but we have no attendees. So maybe if anyone joins later, we can see if there's public comment. So um, I'm not sure if you want to, if uh, there are any questions on the notes or if you want to just jump into um, this issue of, uh, you know, going through this chart and seeing where, what the recommendations are for each of these items. Can I just ask Danny a, a question, kind of yes. uh, your experience, Danny, for the um, ALDs? You know, sure. I think you're really, um, for what I picked up when you were talking about them, you're very supportive of these, it sounds like. It's, um, it's Yes and no. Um, I, I have referred to them in the past as unicorns because uh, I don't give them out easily uh, personally. And I, I think that um, the, that is reflective of OCTC's approach to them. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously my first 10 years with the agency were general counsel. Um, so I've only been in, in OCTC for about three and a half years. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, my, my longevity with the department, there may be a different attitude towards them you know, prior to, to my tenure here. Um, but they're, they're not given out lightly. Um, uh, so, you know, in theory, hopefully when we give them out, it is appropriate. Um, and I do really see the benefits of locking uh, a respondent into having to admit, like, so that's because that's the, that's the, the carrot, right? You have to admit to it. You can't get an ALD by pleading no contest or by saying, you know, we're just going to make this arrangement um, without having to admit that you committed misconduct. You have to admit to the misconduct. And if they don't want to agree to it, or they don't want to agree to the language that I put forth in, in the ALD, they're, they're just not going to get it um, because uh, it's really simple. We can go forward and you know, if you want to take your chances and think that you'll be exonerated or get an admonishment, um, which are always, you know, possibilities in cases where you are considering extending an ALD. Um, so uh, this way, you know, you have them locked in. Uh, you have the benefit of they have to admit to what they did. They have to admit to the specific set of underlying facts. Um, and that way you, you have that in your hand and you will never have to let that go. And once they, if they violate the ALD, you're not going to have to go back and prove the underlying case. So okay. it, it is really beneficial in that regard. Okay. Yeah, I, I can definitely see the benefit of it. Um, one question I have is what do you tell the complainant? Um, so since I, I just had a conversation um, like that the other day, I, I basically tell them what I just told you, um, which is that um, I, I have concerns about, you know, what level of discipline I would get if I were to take it to trial. Um, I have concerns that maybe um, it results in something like an admonishment uh, and that uh, I don't want to, you know, in exchange for the benefit of making this person admit to what they did, uh, they're gonna they're, and then they're gonna be subject to the same terms of probation that you would if you had a disciplinary case. Like if you if they'd ended up with a private approval or a public approval, by and large the the um, the terms are the same. You know you're you're looking at quarterly reports. You're looking at um, you know you know obeying all uh, you know filing a statement that says you're gonna obey all of the rules of professional conduct and all of the the state bar act. And that uh, you're going to have to do client trust accounting school. You're going to have to do ethics school. You're going to have to take and pass the NPRE. So these are all things that they would get because um, there's, you know, there's there's the private approval, the public private, the public public, and state suspension. All of those, nobody's ever losing their ability to practice. But so although they are progressive, you know, by and large, the person is not looking at you know losing any time for practice. And other than those steps. Um, the increment of rule of discipline is the same. So um, you're, you're, while you're eliminating um, any of those different options um, for the level of discipline, you know, what the, the attorney is substantively going through as far as probation, it, it's the same thing for an agreement in lieu of discipline. So um, we're, we're basically getting the same, you know, pound of flesh that you would get through a state suspension um, other than, you know, right after state becomes actual suspension. So it is, I, I try to explain this to the, um, to the complaining witness. I explain to them that they're the only ones who are gonna know about it. I do explain to them that it's not a prior uh, and you know, that, so that's the one you know, benefit that they're getting and that it's not public and that they as this, the complaining witness 
are the only people who are going to be privy to the existence of this. You know, what you can't do um, is you can't tell them not to tell anybody. Uh, uh, they have the right to know about it. Um, and whether they keep that to themselves, um, you know, you can explain to them this is confidential. It's not going to go on their record. But I, I know there have been, you know, circumstances where uh, complaining witnesses have disclosed this information to other people. So. So really the only difference is truly that it's not public. Um, a private private uh, is, there's two levels of private approval. A private private is not public. Um, you can get a private approval after disciplinary charges are filed. That is public, a public private because the charges have been filed and yeah. um, that, that never goes away. That's a, a public information. A private private is when you stip, stip uh, someone out to a private approval before the discipline charges are filed. And those are, you know, confidential. So people don't know about that. The difference is a private private is prior discipline, right? So it's one step up from the, from the ALD. So we, we can give discipline that's confidential. So. Okay. Thank you so much. So just to clarify, so that if there's then future discipline, the ALD cannot be considered as prior discipline at all. That's right, that's right. Do we have any other questions for Kennedy? But if, they, but if they violate the ALD, that's grounds for discipline and you need not prove that case because they've already admitted to it. So I have to prove that they violated the ALD, but I don't have to prove the underlying case, right? That's that's the huge benefit. Like there's a process, you know, but you, you know, basically I get to attach the ALD to my notice of disciplinary charges. And I know, you know, I no longer have to prove that respondent John, uh, you know, failed to show up at trial, that he, you know, failed to return a $400 retainer, that he failed to communicate all of those things, like those things are already proven. I don't have to worry about that. My only job is at that point is that to then prove that um, that these were the terms and conditions of the ALD and he uh, he didn't follow through with them. So it's a much easier case for me than if I had to go back and prove that he failed to appear at trial, failed to communicate, failed to perform, so. And then everything becomes public, the, the initials and everything, okay. Everything is public at that point. Including the original ALD? Yep. Okay. So, so the ALD itself, like it's not like we go back and redact, you know, what the underlying uh, facts were, everything becomes public. So the fact that he, you know, was hired by this particular client, that the client paid him money, that he failed to appear at trial, all of that stuff, all of that's in the, in the public record at that point. And do you have, have you had, you know, have you had or do you have any pushback from either the complainant on the fact that it's a, a confidential agreement in lieu of discipline, or have you had other um, individuals um, maybe who have come to your, you know, talking about the state bar and, and that they have these confidential agreements, any negativity towards them? Sure, uh, you definitely, definitely have complaining witnesses who I, I think we've been sued over it before. I, you know, um, there's there's a there's a whole you know contingency of population who who thinks that they uh, they know better than whatever decisions that we make. And uh, again, you know, like I said, I was in general counsel, so the the lawsuits abound. Um, but they um, the the uh, I guess that's another unique thing about um, uh, an agreement in lieu of discipline. Uh, if you um, if we close a case or we issue a warning letter, that person has the right uh, to a second look through you know audit and review. It's now called the complaint review unit, um, but they can't request a, a complaint review through uh, if we are, give them an agreement in lieu of discipline. So um, that's a fairly you know um, I, I don't know it, it, it's. It's one of the few circumstances. It's it's like having um, it's like having discipline in that regard. You know, a complaining witness can't has no standing to challenge um, whatever discipline outcome. You know, say I were to give somebody a private approval, a complaining witness can't do anything about that if they think it's too low and they they disagree with the the level of discipline. Um, it's they don't they don't have any standing to to challenge the outcome. Uh, again, not that we haven't been sued for it, um, but. 
and an agreement in lieu of discipline is the same. But if we close a case or if we issue a warning letter, uh, then the complaining witness is allowed to have a second look at the case. So. so that's interesting that even though an ALD is not considered discipline, there's no standing to challenge a decision not to impose discipline. Right, because we have, um, because we've, you know, we've entered into an agreement and they've admitted to culpability. It's not something that the complaint review unit would look at. Okay. And I have, I, I, I guess I have the unique, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's happened to anybody else, but I have had a warning letter taken all the way up to the California Supreme Court. Um, so you can, you can file a Walker petition with the California Supreme Court on a warning letter. Uh, I am happy to say that the California Supreme Court liked my warning letter. Uh, so <laughs> I, it survived that review process, but the complaining witness was so upset at the, at the outcome, uh, they filed a, a Walker petition and the court looked at it. Uh, they, they didn't reject it just because it was a, a warning letter um, and they upheld my warning letter, so. I guess I just, I, I struggle with this ALD a little bit, but you know, it's, it's my uh, history with the medical board and with our, you know, patient advocates, you know, that we see, that's, I think my, I mean, I definitely see the side of it where it's, it's helpful on your side for settling out a case and also for getting the action that you want. I mean, you know, the rehabilitation action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely see that, that benefit of it. I just, I, I struggle with it on the, the public side. Yeah. And I, we, I mean, obviously what cases ALDs are given uh, in have evolved over time. You know, I can tell you that for sure. It's stuff that I've, I saw, um, I've seen, you know, in the way, way before time, like when I started around 2007, they wouldn't necessarily get that same thing now. But I, again, I really don't think my office is in, in the habit of giving these out lightly. They, they never have been, um, and, um, you know, again, then when, uh, if it's the kind of person who's not going to survive an ALD, uh, then we just get them, you know, for the, for the violation of the ALD and it all becomes public anyway. And we have to do a lot less work when it goes to, uh, filing public charges. <clears throat> Pardon me, uh, Danielle, is there uh, a rule or something in writing in the, in OCTC about what types of charges can be eligible for agreement in lieu of discipline and what cannot? It's not like a chart. Uh, it's nothing like that. Um, we have to go through the same process. We go through all of our cases, which is uh, you need a certain level of uh, supervisorial authority in order to, um, to give one out. Um, and if you aren't given that approval, um, then you can't, you're not authorized to give the, to offer the ALD. Well, is there anything, I guess the answer so this is no, but is, is there anything in writing saying, um, for instance, a uh, charge that can lead to disbarment cannot be uh, an ALD? Um, I would have to look at the, the state bar rules of procedure. Uh, they might say that. I'm uh, off the top of my head. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I know we're all given training uh, on what you can and can't give an ALD on. And uh, the only edict that I remember is low le level or aberrational uh, conduct. Um, but I don't know that OCTC has a, like a manual or, or something per se that says that. Um, but I can tell you that I have not looked at the, um, the rules of procedure, like as of late, to, I can double check to see if it's, it's in that part, but um, I don't, um, like, you know, is there, is there a document somewhere that says if you misappropriate $60,000, you can't have an ALD? I don't know that there's a document that says that. Um, but I do know that we are told that it's not for those, those cases. So, and it's, we, we, we go through this um, eight week training, training class when we start, when you start to work here at OCTC, uh, even as somebody who had worked in general counsel's office for 10 years, uh, I was asked to go through the eight week training program. Um, so you're, you know, you're given, you're given, you're given lessons and instructions and we, we have a class on ALDs and you're told what it's for and what it's not for. So I don't know, that's not, I wouldn't consider that like a, a, a like an OCTC policy or procedure, but we have, we have a class on it and we, you have to take a class before you can, can give out an ALD. And even then, so you take the class, you 
uh, you're told what you can and can't give out an ALD on. Um, but then as a, a line attorney in the office, you, if you were to suddenly decide that it would be a good idea to offer an ALD to somebody who stole $60,000, um, you would then you know, submit your, your case memo to uh, your supervisor for approval. And I, I'm pretty sure it would get you know, uh, not approved at that point. So. so there's no regulation or written document that sets forth criteria for what is aberrational? Um, not as far as I know. Um, the word aberrational is just, uh, that's mostly a case by case basis. As from, again, from my experience in uh, OCTC, uh, that doesn't mean that there hasn't ever been one, um, but uh, not, not in my experience. Um, like I said, we're given classes um, and everything you do is subject to supervisor review. Um, and um, we're, that's just the description that we're given, so. I don't know, looking forward, if you wanted to, to, to have that sort of thing for the paraprofessionals working group, maybe you would want to set forth what, what your criteria is for aberrational. I, I don't know. That's a, um, those, are, those are decisions made above my pay grade in this department. So. And it would probably be hard to do it you know, right off the bat because we, we don't really know what all the violations are going to be coming in and what those would look like. You know, and, and I think that that's a problem that, that any agency has. And you also got to understand that, you know, whatever you guys create is, an, is going to be organic the same way, uh, you know, OCTC is and the state bar is. I mean, you know, we get, we get new chiefs every couple of years. Uh, we get new executive directors. We get new general counsels. We get new everybody. Uh, we get new board members. So um, what may be considered aberrational five years ago may not be considered aberrational now. Um, and I think that that may be one of the reasons that leads to, um, uh, you know, more genericized terms. And that's also, a, well, I can tell you this, that's also a word that's used very frequently by the state bar court when it um, wants to deviate from the standards, uh, you know, so because we have the standards, so the standards are promulgated, they give you a guideline on what level of discipline, they're, they're like sentencing guidelines. Um, but uh, whenever, you know, we want, you know, we've got a standard that says 90 days for commingling. And uh, uh, we just had a case come out of the review department. That's what the standard says. You, you commingle, you got, you get 90 days. We had a guy who commingled and he did it repeatedly. Um, and you could see the review department was just not going to give him 90 days for a commingling case. And so they, they, you know, they, they either use the word aberrational or, you know, misunderstanding. And, you know, I, I think aberrational, um, objectively speaking, it's actually not that hard of a, um, it's not, it's not that hard of a term to define. I mean, when you have somebody who's got no other complaints, they, um, they've, they've got a, you know, a great career or, or whatever it is, um, and you look at their behavior before and after the incident, um, that's going to give you an idea of whether or not this is aberrational. And if you've got somebody who says that they didn't do anything wrong, is digging in and has said that this is you know, something I, I do before and I, I would do it again and you're just wrong, uh, that's not aberrational. Um, but when you have somebody who, you know, when, once their mistake comes to light, uh, is horrified at uh, what has happened um, and you know profusely apologizes to anybody and everybody involved and does whatever they can to attempt to make it right and has no other history of complaints, you've got objective indicia that this is aberrational, right? Um, you, you, can, you can see it. And you know, there are obviously some cases that even if it's aberrational, um, if it's not low level discipline, uh, we really don't care that it's aberrational. And you know, we're gonna, it, that's why you've got you know, the, the two factors there, you know, low, low level discipline and aberrational. You're not, I don't care that you never stole $60,000 before just because you only stole it once and it was aberrational. I still going to try to disbar you for it. So. Um, Danny, you, you <laughs> mentioned those standards again. What are those standards called? Um, the standards for attorney sanctions uh, for uh, gosh, now, now that you made me say it, I can usually say it off the top of my head. There, there are the standards for attorney sanctions for uh, uh, professional misconduct. Uh, the, I, because I was looking at something the other day. I got it here somewhere. Yeah, it's something on the website the also. The discipline standards, Danny. Yeah, yeah, that's all I mean. Okay. And, and are um, those in some state bar regulation? They're in the um, the state bar rules of procedure. Okay. 
I just opened, got that off the internet. And, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, there's, there's sentencing guidelines. I don't, um, right. they are not, there's like a whole, you know, set of case law about the, the fact that they're, um, they're not binding, but they're entitled to great weight. Uh, and we have, you know, some for basically almost everything. I think there's, uh, um, you, and you mentioned a case where, uh, there was not uh, the, the standard said 90 days for commingling, but the hearing judge was not going to give him 90 days. In that Actually, case, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to ask you if that in that kind of a case, does the judge have to explain why he or she uh, veered from the standards? Yes. Um, and so for actually for that case, the hearing department gave us the 90 days uh, without a problem. Uh, but what he appealed and went up to the review department and the review department, uh, I think they can't remember whether they gave him a state or they gave him a public approval. Um, they, they just, they weren't, you know, they, they go through whatever analysis they're getting. They basically, they gave him a lot more mitigation than the hearing department did and they dropped it down. So I think it was a, a public approval. It's an unpublished case, but it's something that I, uh, I saw recently because I was watching my own case go up and I watched the oral argument on that one. So, and, you know, we, we, we go through that with a lot of cases, I, you know, the, um, the Silverton case says you follow the standards, you know, they're entitled to great weight. And then you have to explain when you deviate from the standards. Um, that said, you know, you got to understand that the state bar promulgates the standards uh, and OCTC has a lot of input on those standards. Um, but, you know, the state bar court judges may not necessarily agree with, you know, uh, what the discipline is under the standards. And there's ways to argue with the aggravation and mitigation that um, maybe you should deviate from the standards. And yes, they, the, the judges are required to explain why they deviate. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so changes to the standards every now and then are initiated by OCTC? Um, I, think they, I think they have to go through the whole process of board approval. Um, I think they go before RAD, if it's still called RAD. Um, and um, in order for them to, they, they go, they have the same thing. They go through a subcommittee, they are revised, uh, and then they're approved, I think, by the board ultimately. Okay. So if you're, you know, setting up the, the type of thing, you, you, know, you, could, you could give yourself your own set of standards to hopefully try to, you know, eliminate disparity between cases and to, you know, lessen the burden on your, your prosecutors and on your whatever judicial board you have for what a particular case is worth. What do you guys think about um, a structure where you start out without this mechanism in place? Can't hear you very well. Oh, you can't hear me? You, Not you, too well. Um, can everybody uh, else? Let me minute? turn mine up. <laughs> okay. Um, where you start out without it and then based on a review of what you're actually seeing in terms of the nature of the complaints, you, you develop it. I don't know, I'm kind of struggling with this idea of how do we decide what is appropriate for an ALD, what's appropriate for a fine, what's appropriate for this and what's appropriate for that outside of the, the traditional discipline process without any data. I don't know. And I, I hate to say this, but sometimes when you're looking at the case, once you become familiar enough with it, and Danny probably would agree with this, it's almost like one of those things, you know it when you see it, you know, because you know, you see a case like Danny is saying where, you know, the individual has no other complaint this is almost like um, a one-off for, for lack of better term, you know, but, but it is something that could be definitely misused, um, sure. you know, if, if not putting some parameters around it. Um, sight and fine, that, that one is maybe something, Leah, once we see the rules that are put together for paraprofessionals, Maybe that's when you go in and you look at the list and say, you know, these would be the things that are very minor, low level that you would issue a citation for versus 
um, you know, it going through even ALD or the disciplinary process. Um, I know for some of the boards, that's how they do it with D in DCA, while others say any violation of any of the code sections or regulations um, can be a citation. Um, it, it just depends board by board. At, at medical board, we literally had a list of uh, BMP code sections, health and safety code sections, and our own regulations, where if it was a violation of this, this would be something we would be able to issue a citation and fine for. Now, it didn't limit us from also filing it in an accusation and taking action, but um, that I wouldn't say that's the way to do it, because then you back yourself into a corner, but that is something that um, could potentially be done once the regulations you know, are built. How about if we um, talk about whether we think ALDs uh, should be in the paraprofessional uh, uh, program or not? You know, it's, are there reasons to do it, reasons not to do it? Are we at a place where that's appropriate to talk about? Yeah, <laughs> I think so, yeah. I, I actually like Leah's idea where we don't start out with um, offering an ALD and maybe see if there is a reason for it down the road, um, especially because the attorneys don't have this citation and fine program. So because you are putting that in, maybe you see how that works out and then the discipline side and then see if there's a need for this kind of middle ground. That That's just my two cents. I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but it, it, one thing occurs to me is uh, is to make the the discipline system um, uh, as as the same as the uh, state bar system uh, as much as we can, um, because it's, it's it's there's lots of law on it and uh, for interpretation purposes, because uh, it seems to be fair to the paraprofessionals to have the same system. Um, uh, oh, and because the, uh, the, the state bar staff and the first two levels of our uh, chart who are doing the investigating, they all be familiar with those things, with, with, if we, with the procedures and discipline uh, types that uh, the state bar uses. But I see your point, Kim, about not, uh, that we have this one additional thing <laughs> um, that doesn't match, so maybe we don't need both. Sorry about the phone. Um, you know, I wasn't around in the early days of this subcommittee, and I wasn't, um, I'm not, I, I understand that you all added the citation and fine as an additional, you know, um, some. why? Just because it's, it's been at the department for about 20, 25 years, Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, it, it, it does address low level violations. It does include a fine. Um, but but why 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 did you want to add the citation and fine, or is it because you just didn't know much about the ALDs, or the other sanctions? Wasn't it because we uh, we were talking about probation? I I or no not probation uh, diversion diversion, and I suggested diversion. I remember, and and then we said well no that doesn't quite work but because we've got the I mean. How about instead of diversion, using the citation and fine? Isn't that the history of it? Anyway, whether it is or not, um, I don't. I don't know if all of us, if any of us, remembers how we got there. Maybe you do. I know. I've been a favor. I've been a fan of it because I, for a long time, thought we should be have fines on the attorney discipline side where you just levy like a thousand dollar fine on somebody. 
failure to, you know, return a client file, levy a fine on him. Mm. I feel like um, it, it's some it's something missing from the attorney discipline side. <laughs> so I I was so it appealed to me this idea that it's a very low level intervention. It doesn't take a lot of um, kind of resources on the state bar side. And it can be very effective because people don't like to pay fines. And if they don't pay it, then they get their license suspended. So to me, it seems like it's kind of an easy one. But um, so I don't know, Julie, that answers your question. But I, I know I personally liked it. But I am struggling with citation and fine. I think the way we're talking about citation and fine would be like for the lowest level offenses, then you'd have an ALD, then you'd have formal discipline. But I'm not sure if that all is, makes sense. I don't know what you think about that, Danny. Um, it may be too many gradations and it doesn't really make sense. Well, I, I think you, you do have to worry about, um, if you'll recall not too long ago, um, one of the, the processes that we do have to compel attorneys to pay uh, monetary awards for fee arbitration awards is, is that's an administrative suspension. Ooh, my screen just went blank. I don't know if you can still see me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oop, can't hear you. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute now. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, so you can hear me now. Yes. And okay, I can't, I can't see anybody. But okay. Anyway, so uh, we have the process for uh, fee arbitration awards. When you, um, when you don't pay a fee arbitration award, we have an administration suspension, uh, suspension that still goes through state bar court. And um, because that was a, a, a compelling somebody to pay a, a monetary award, um, we were sued in the bankruptcy court uh, because the attorney tried to discharge um, the fee arbitration award in bankruptcy. And uh, we were actually told by the Ninth Circuit that we couldn't do that anymore because it was dischargeable in bankruptcy. It's one of the very few lawsuits that uh, the state bar has ever lost. We don't lose very many lawsuits. Uh, so you have to worry about when you start getting into monetary sanctions and monetary fines, um, the bankruptcy aspect of whether or not um, people will go and try to discharge these sanctions and bankruptcies. And there's a very complicated analysis about uh, what, uh, what government fines are and are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. We were very fortunate, uh, basically right before I got here, um, uh, to have um, the Ninth Circuit uphold disciplinary costs as not dischargeable in bankruptcy, but we were not as fortunate when it came to the uh, fee arbitration award. So um, if you're gonna start levying uh, monetary sanctions, you have to worry about um, whether or not um, you're gonna have, you know, first, first of all, due process, uh, due process, um, allegations about you know whether or not they have the right to a hearing before you assess those fines and then whether or not these fines are dischargeable in bankruptcy and what processes we have in place in order to deal with that and general counsel would know more about that they actually finished the sure case after i left that department and went to uh, octc well there you are okay now i can see myself again and Julie, I think just to add on to what Leah said, um, it was le something that Leah kind of asked to walk through the process. And um, we, we discussed early on about that ability to issue um, something. A, to me, the benefit of citation and fine really is that, A, it, it gets their attention on something that, you know, could, I mean, every violation could go to discipline, I guess, but you know, some of them are, you're not gonna probably get any discipline out of some of them, but um, it, it's something that for those lower level violations, it brings it to the individual's attention. To me, the other benefit is it's public, it's, it's on their website. Um, the other benefit, you don't do to, you know, our, our, our citations can only go up to $5,000 and even, that that's only if they have usually other violations up before that of citations where it's a repeated act or it's something extremely egregious usually they can only go up to about 2500 so it's not a lot of money but the impact that it has because it goes on someone's disciplinary record i am it, it it's pretty powerful to try to make sure that they're not going to repeat that offense 
um, from that perspective. I mean, we even have individuals what would go up through the process. We would issue citation and fine for failing to change their address. And that was something they would fight it tooth and nail just because it was something that goes onto their website as a citation, even though it was just for failing to notify the board of their address of record within 30 days. So it, it's something that they won't do it again. You know, if they if they move, they're not going to 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 fail to notify us. So I, I think it's just a good tool to try to rehabilitate individuals um, without the extreme you know, having to get an attorney, you know, for this group, it's getting an attorney involved, but without the expense of going through a disciplinary process. So let's go back to Iris' question, because I do think we got to reach some agreement on whether to, you know, um, have ALDs, let's set aside citation and fine, unless Julie, you're thinking kind of my question, like, are we going to have the, all of these different things? We now have citation and fine and ALD and so, but are we going to recommend that ALDs be part of the paraprofessional sort of disciplinary paradigm from the outset as an option? If you each have to say yes or no at this point, I think Kim would say no. What about you, Julie? Um, I, I, I think in hindsight, I mean, I think I like the idea of the addition of citation and fine. And I think we are not precluded from doing something slightly different from the attorney discipline system um, brings to the attention of the board of trustees and others that other agencies have other mechanisms to deal with these low-level violations that are equally um, effective and transparent. Um, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and the ALDs are not transparent at all, and there don't seem to. I mean. Um, there's not a lot of concrete criteria for their use. So I'm kind of in the ballpark of let's try to get the citation and fine mechanism and start out without the ALD. Evaluate its need, necessity, justification down the line when we see what kind of complaints we're getting. Ira, what about you? Yeah, I go along with that. I, 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 let me add that uh, I, I uh, got the the, what's it called, the uh, rules of procedure uh, just now from the uh, State Bar's website. And it does have those uh, standards for uh, discipline. Uh, it's the last section of it. And anyway, there's no, uh, I did a search and I'm pretty certain that I, that I, that there is no, uh, there's nothing in the rules of procedure or those standards that, that say what, uh, uh, can what kind of charges can and cannot be um, uh, given um, an ALD? So those are just for discipline, and since ALD doesn't fall into the category of discipline, the standards don't address those. Uh, well, they got all kinds of. Okay. But I think Ira, if you're in agreement on this general concept that we're not going to include an ALD component, at least not at the outset. Yeah. Then I think that that's great. And while we have Danny here, maybe ha I know I was late. Did you guys get to the ADP piece yet? No. <laughs> okay. So maybe we could move on to ADP, and then when we let Danny go, we could talk about citation and fine a little bit more? Because I, I know for me, I'm not clear. Does it always go together with the citation versus a fine? We just say them like they're one word. So I want to make sure I understand that. But why don't we go to ADP? Because I think this is the other question. Is this something that's going to be available for paraprofessionals? And if so, in the same manner that it is for attorneys?
So I can tell you, I remember um, Ms. Felmuth brought up, um, I can't remember where that, that when that study was that you had, you had mentioned, it was like 2008 or 2009, where oh. ADP basically had like a 13% graduation weight. Um, and uh, it was not, it was not the program that we have today. Um, and I, and I can tell you this, it is, uh, um, it's a resource consuming endeavor, you know, because you've got LAP and that, that the treatment program is, is working. Um, but it, um, it consumes resources when it comes to your judicial officers, your judicial staff, and then OCTC. Um, because, you know, normally when you, when you have a, um, a discipline case, uh, say we were to uh, either after trial or we were to enter a stipulation that would have um, like mental health and, or substance abuse terms and conditions where we would say as part of your probation, we need you to uh, attend mental health counseling and provide proof of that to your uh, probation officer. Or we need you to abstain and engage in uh, blood testing, whatever. And again, show proof that, you know, to your, your probation officer with ADP, again, this is going on during the middle of a disciplinary proceeding and the disciplinary process kind of stops um, and the court is actively monitoring your treatment. And then you get the rest of your discipline at the end. Right. So uh, you've got, you know, basically a judge and their support staff and a prosecutor involved uh, in making sure you're getting through your treatment program, whatever that treatment program is. Whereas if you just add those uh, conditions to uh, as probation conditions, then that becomes probation's burden, not your burden. Now, again, that said, um, I think that the changes that have been made, you know, between when the ADP first started and now um, that because of the narrowed scope of how you use ADP, I think it's a lot less burdensome uh, on both offices, on the state bar court and on OCTC than it was in the beginning. Um, and um, we've got a lot better success rate for that reason. I mean, it's being applied to the type of cases that it should be applied to. So uh, the success rate is better and the burden on both um, on both offices is less than it was, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago. Do you know uh, if you could let me screen share? I did get the re the latest recidivism stats from Ron. Um, I have not looked at this super carefully prior to showing it to you here. Can you guys see this, or it's, it's really small? It's teeny. I I um, maybe, maybe um, Linda can this, email that to I, us. I can, but is this getting better? Yeah. yeah. No. Right. Oh no. No, I. Well, okay. Now you're now you're kind of getting there. Now I'm getting there. So the way <laughs> this works is it's um, cases closed by type and by year. So this is an ADP case. This is an ALD case. This is a straight probation case, and this is one with a reproval. I'm not sure why this is called probation cases. So, cause not all of these folks are on probation to my knowledge, but maybe they are. Um, so by year cases closed. So you can see, first of all, it's just not very many cases in the ADP program here. Right. And then you can see the recidivism. Here, the recidivism event is subsequent complaints after case closure. So simply whether or not <clears throat> another complaint was filed. What does REP stand for again, REP? Approval. So you can see here that the ADP, um, you know, recidivism rate just on a subsequent complaint is pretty high. Then you go over here, subsequent complaints that actually got forwarded to investigation, right? Because just because somebody got a complaint um, and you can see again that your subsequent complaints forwarded to investigation are pretty high in comparison to these other sort of disciplinary outcomes. And then this is an actually a subsequent complaint got filed with the state bar court and again, you see here, other than like 2014, where you got this outlier over here, the ADP is pretty high. So um, 
what I will say, we did it within one year, within two years, the numbers get even higher. I will send this out as well as the board report. This is something when, when I was executive director, I really wanted to start looking at the efficacy of our system. And you'll see overall, our recidivism rates are high in terms of the number of attorneys that get complained about churning through the system, which, you know, led me to think our system isn't very effective overall, right? Because if you, people keep coming back through it, it's telling you you're doing something wrong. Um, but I remembered that we had done this data and done this analysis. And I remembered that it didn't look super hot for ADP. I mean, you can see as you start going multiple years out, it doesn't look that great for anybody. So to, for what it's worth, we do Yikes. have it and we can share it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll send the board report too because it really was sort of like, gosh, you know, we've got all of this heavy pressure and legislative focus on like getting cases through in six months. Nobody's pressuring us on the efficacy of our system. And right in the criminal justice side, we really started looking at recidivism a long time ago, but we haven't been looking at it here. I don't know, Kim, if, if your boards look at this at all, but for us, the data doesn't look too great. You know, this is something, Leah, this is wonderful. I mean, all of our boards should do this. I don't know that I've seen anybody that has actually done that. Um, I, once you send this to me, I, I would like to actually use this with our boards, though, to look at. But I can tell you just from being at the board for such a long time, it doesn't surprise me because we would have individuals that would come in on probation and end up on probation again. Um, you know, you start recognizing some of the names as things go through the process. Um, so I'm not surprised by the data. Um, may I ask a question? Uh, a recidivism event for somebody who's in ADP, generally is that the, the relapse into substance abuse or is it, can it be anything else too? It could be anything. It's just, um, we, you see how they were defined. Like uh, if you got a, a complaint, it could be a complaint about anything. The, the okay. recidivism defined as getting another complaint a complaint being forwarded to investigation or actually something being filed in state bar court. It depends on how you define recidivism. And probably you wouldn't want to define it just as another complaint received, right. but maybe if it's, it's substantiated enough to move to investigation, you might want to count those or just state bar court filing. And from our perspective, we would agree with you that you'd want to take it like to the farther limit down because it is one thing we did find, you know, because you do post these publicly, I think when individuals see like, you know, this individual is on probation. And so even minor things that they would do, I think we'd get a complaint faster than if, you know, they had gone and looked at the individual's record and there was nothing on there. So I, I do think that plays into it a little bit, which is why you want to look at your recidivism, at least, you know, maybe when they get subsequent action. Oh, it goes to investigation. In terms of yeah. substance abuse, um, uh, Kim, are meeting that the department and its boards are now subject to something called the uniform standards. This is in Business and Professional Code Section 315, I believe. And um, these, these um, came about because the legislature looked at various diversion programs. And when I use that term, I mean, uh, that deal with substance abuse and mental health, where those one of those or both is determined to be the cause of the violation, and they are diverted out of the discipline track and into this monitoring program, however that is, is um, constructed. Um, and the legislature determined that all the DCA boards that had these programs here completely uh, all, across, all over the map, nobody talked to each other, Nobody had consistent criteria um, for anything, like, like how often do you require a drug test? Uh, how often do you require a group meetings with a facilitator? Uh, what happens when you commit a major violation of your diversion agreement? What happens when you commit them? Nobody had any standards, much less consistent standards. So this BNP code section 315 required the department to convene a substance abuse coordination committee 
to come up with uniform standards in 16 specific areas um, that all department boards must use in cases, shall use is the word, in cases involving substance abuse. Um, and I believe, Kim, in uniform standard 16, you might want to take another look at that because I think boards are supposed to be reporting lots and lots of data about folks that go into these diversion programs and then either come out successfully or unsuccessfully. There may be some recidivism requirements already in 16. It's just that I'm not sure many are complying with 16 yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Leah and or Danny, are you aware whether state audits or anybody else has done a subsequent audit of the LAP program after that 2008-ish one that I referred to. I think that 2008-ish audit focused more on LAP and not on ADP, but I could be wrong. Yeah, no, um, I don't <laughs> believe so. Yeah, I don't think so either. And I think your, your outcomes would be different depending on whether you're looking at ADP graduation rates versus LAP, because that's just a separate treatment program. Um, and you don't have to be in ADP to, to be in LAP. Anybody can do LAP. Yeah, but I think what I was getting at is that a condition of key, uh, success is completion of the LAP program. And back in 2008, that's what had the 13% completion rate of LAP because lawyers were just dropping out all over the place. Right. And, and you know, I, I served as the medical board enforcement monitor from 2003 to 2005. And one of my jobs was to audit and evaluate that board's diversion program. And I can tell you that the staff was, um, you know, very high on this concept, high on its implementation. But when you actually got in and looked at it, there were no criteria, no rules, no standards, no statutes, no nothing. There was kind of an unenforceable procedure manual uh, that was meaningless. And, and, and it was understaffed, under-resourced. Um, and, and so I, I appreciate the information that you think it's you know, performing better than it did in 2008, but I, I would, but those recidivism data don't look good. <laughs> And um, sometimes you need an independent audit um, to determine whether a program like that is effective. But Julie, this data is not LA, is not LAP data. This is not people right. that are voluntarily These, in the LAP program. I'm not suggesting that program is particularly effective either, mostly because so few attorneys avail themselves of it. Um, and as you know, we've advocated for that to go over to CLA thinking that maybe attorneys would be more interested in, you know, um, taking advantage of this program on a voluntary basis if it wasn't part of the disciplinary agency. But um, that, you know, the data I shared and I just sent around is on the ADP side, you're in the discipline system right. and you've got to comply. Um, but just stepping back, so, in the D, just to make sure I understand, and the medical board side, Kim, the, there is no such thing as ADP, right? What happens if somebody, well, what happens if you come in and in our world, there is misconduct and there's a determination that your substance use or mental health issue is, you know, was the cause of your misconduct, which I think is different than in the medical world where there's not necessarily any misconduct, right? Because you're reported yeah. for having a substance use issue. So tell us how it happens on your side. So each board varies, Leah, a little bit in how they do this and what they're authorized to do. So some boards actually, you have to go through the full process of enforcement, um, even if it is um, a mental health and substance abuse issue and end up going into probation. And then from probation, part of the terms and conditions of your probation would be you go into a, a monitoring program. And then like Julie said, you know, there's certain um, standards that they have to meet within that. So that's one thing. Another, another um, entity has the ability, you get brought to the board's attention and it's only for alcohol and substance abuse and you'd be able to divert kind of like ADP, but not because 
usually what happens is you go into that program and you get diverted from enforcement. You complete the program and then you end up getting um, action to where um, it, that goes away. The whole uh, whole event goes away. And so you can su successfully complete the monitoring program. No action is taken against you. Um, and then there's some individuals who can just self-refer into that if they know they have a program. And I think that's more like your LAP program um, for your side. Um, but if you have an individual that comes in and they have both drugs and alcohol and a misconduct, they're going to have to proceed for most any board through the process to go all the way. But they could be going into the monitoring program as that goes along and that can be used as mitigation. And then at the end, when they get probation taken, it's added on that they have to go into this program as well as meet other terms and conditions. So it's kind of multifaceted depending on the board. Okay. I mean, the, the best thing about, the reason I actually think your ADP program, just the way it sounded like everything was laid out, that's very different. Because again, we could only have solely, you know, drugs and alcohol too. Um, but what I like about yours is they actually go to this um, pre-taking disciplinary action. You kind of walk through this process with them. Like, are you a good candidate to go in this? Taking into consideration your disciplinary action as well. We have diversion evaluation committees with some of our boards where you go to this deck and they review you, but they're not looking at all about the discipline side of it. They're just looking at it more from the perspective of, you know, getting into the monitoring program, right, Julie? It's more of a solely focused on the substance abuse side as to where for yours, it sounds like they're taking everything into consideration at that point for that individual. Linda, can you put those notes back up, please? Um, when you say they, Danny, one question I had, I wasn't sure exactly how someone gets into LAP. So do they, number one, does the respondent have to request it? Yes, you have to, on the one hand, you make the request to state bar court, you, you know, you file a pleading in state bar court, and then separately you contact LAP and you are required to um, sign a contract with them. Uh, there have been ADP cases where the respondent, for whatever reason, is just not willing to sign on to, to LAP terms, and then he's no longer eligible for ADP. So the requirement to get into ADP is that you go and you meet with LAP, and you see what they're, you know, they look at you, they set up the, what they want from you. There's a participant, it's called a participation agreement. And if the respondent won't sign on to the participation agreement, then they're, they're just not eligible for ADP. So you file your request, you go to LAP, you sign a contract, and then who's making the determination? Yes, you're in ADP. Uh, the judge. Um, that, that would be the point of, if, if OCTC wants to object, that's the point in time that we object. Um, we say that they're not, you know, they're not eligible either based on the, the nature of the, um, the misconduct or, um, and I think now we actually have an opportunity to, to uh, look at and object to whether or not they've sufficiently shown the nexus or, or whether or not they're uh, going to be sufficiently rehabilitated. So we, we have, we now, we didn't in the beginning, we now have points in time where we can, we can, um, we can have input on that, um, and but ultimately the state bar court is the one who gets to make the decision as to whether or not uh, they've shown a sufficient nexus. They've uh, you know signed onto the binding agreements with uh, participation in LAP and to let them into the program. Okay. So and you know LAP is a creation of statute. Uh, if you wanted to to kick it somewhere, you would have to um, you would have to have a statutory change, and the statute that creates. LAP, I forget the abbreviations for it. It's like ADEA, can't remember off the top of my head. Um, that statute that creates LAP is the one that says, if you successfully complete this, you will be given consideration for this in your discipline, uh, in, in, in a disciplinary case. So mostly the statute focuses on the creation of LAP, but it's the one that allows for uh, uh, mitigation uh, in your disciplinary case, which is how uh, that's how ADP was created because of the suggestion that you could get mitigation in a disciplinary case for participating in LAP. Okay. 
So, Danny, can I ask just a quick question on that? So, but during the time they're in the ADP program, they're not doing any other rehabilitative effort as far as what was the allegations in the complaint. Is that true? So, yes, um, but uh, the, what they have done is agree to what happened. Um, so that's at that point in time, basically, you're looking at, you know, versus so sort of sentencing versus culpability. At that point, you have agreed that you have, you know, you have to come to an agreement as re regard, regarding the stipulation of facts. You have to say, this is what happened and this is what I did. Uh, so that is set in stone already and that gets you into ADP. So then uh, you're never going to go back and go to trial on what happened. That's already done. You just, the only thing you're doing that at that point is court supervised treatment. And then the rest of your you know, punishment or your sentencing, you know, uh, is what happens at the end, right? It, you, because, you know, if you've completed it successfully, you get six months. If you don't complete it successfully, you get a year. But then you get all of your other probation conditions, the, the quarterly reports, the client trust accounting school, restitution, all of those things, right? But I guess the issue is, is they're practicing during that time. So they're not getting any rehabilitative um, efforts for their practice that may need, be needed as well. So the, I think the idea is, and if you, if you look at it in terms of somebody who's been drinking, um, you're participating in LAP. So first of all, you're engaged in treatment. Second of all, you're abstaining. So you know, the idea is that you are able to um, continue your practice because you're actively, you are actively treating the, prob the, the problems that uh, caused you to commit misconduct, right? So if you've got an alcoholic, who's in, you know, who's, who's sober and who's engaged in treatment, there's not necessarily a reason for that person to not uh, be engaged in practice. Now, again, like I said, there are a multitude of external factors where, you know, you, you can ask for them to be put on an active status if you think that that is appropriate. And we would know based on other complaints coming in and other cases coming down the pipe, whether or not there is still something going on here that such that it would not be appropriate for them to be allowed to continue their practice um, just because of the simple fact that they're in ADP and LAP. Um, Danny, you yes. just said uh, once you're in ADP, you've admitted a violation and you agree to court supervised treatment. Yeah. And my understanding is that treatment can be done in lab or through mechanisms other. Is that correct? Right. Right. So what it is, is um, I'll just explain to you the process. You, you sign on to, you enter into the stipulation. Uh, the court approves that. You give your brief on high low, a level of discipline and all that goes to the court. And the court um, says, okay, this person is going into ADP. And um, basically for lack of a better term, the respondent goes off to LAP. And I don't see anything about the case for about three months. And, right, and the, the court sets another status conference. And right before that status conference, uh, we all get a report from LAP that tells us how they're doing, that tells us if they're in compliance and basically if they're in compliance. Um, so then the only thing that the court and I are doing um, is sort of checking in with, uh, with respondent, you know, and assuming everything is going well, we get a, a, a quarterly report that says he's in compliance. You know, we have a small conversation, how are you doing? Um, and we set another court date. So that, that's the level of court and OCTC supervision when somebody's in the ADP. Now, if somebody is having problems, if they miss a test, if they stop going to group meetings, we will get an immediate notification from LAP of noncompliance. So uh, say, um, you know, we've gone through three quarters and everything's been doing great. And then the person falls off the wagon. Um, I, there's a, either a dirty test or a missed test I'm gonna get an email right away. The court's gonna get an email right away. And then we're gonna set a hearing, right? Uh, the court will, even if the next status conference is three months out, the court's gonna set another hearing if we you know, we start to see problems. And then we're gonna argue, and depending on how bad it is, I'm gonna argue for, for them to get kicked out of ADP and a respondent's gonna have his opportunity to argue that he should be allowed in. And it was a one-time thing and he fell off the wagon. And then the court's gonna make a determination, right? That we go, you go through that process. Um, and if somebody's not making it, um, then eventually, you know, the court will will grant OCTC's request to have ADP terminated. They will be terminated, and then the the high level of discipline will be imposed. Uh, do people have dirty tests um, or missed tests, and do they go through a period of problems? 
And does OCTC argue for the for ADP to be terminated? And do we lose? Sure, we do. Um, I, I think that it's not an unheard of uh, concept that a lot of people think that uh, remission and rehabilitation and sobriety is a is a progress, and, and that people make mistakes along that 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 path, and that they um, they make the most mistakes, they fall off the wagon, they get back on the wagon, and they they want to be allowed to continue forward, and the court gives them those opportunities. So. Um, just you know, one one dirty test is not going to get them kicked out of ADP. Uh, you know, maybe by the time we're on two, uh, I'm arguing for them to be kicked out. Um, and maybe if I'm really lucky, by the time we're on three, that they're going to get kicked out. But that's I can tell you that is one of the reasons that ADP lasts three years, right? Uh, you've got 36 months of this. Uh, there are opportunities for them to to make missteps and then put themselves back together. But you know, those people who are going to fall off the wagon, they they usually that 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 deterioration usually happens, you know, fairly quickly and then they're, they're, they're not gonna make it at that point. And then they, they term out of ADP, so. I don't wanna get us too far into the weeds here, but um, I, I get all that. Uh, same, you know, the, at the medical board's prior diversion program, relapse is expected. It's just, that's life. Um, and the, the facts guide future dealings with that particular person in terms of whether they're allowed to continue in the program or whether they're referred for discipline. I, the other day, I think you or somebody said, maybe it was a, a judge, um, that if the, if the ADP participant with a substance abuse problem doesn't choose to go into lap, they can, they can be monitored in some other way. And one of those ways was cited as AA. AA meetings. AA meetings are anonymous. You, you, you know, we had, a, there was a guy, a famous guy over at the medical board who sent his, his, uh, the, the nurse or the office manager who had also been appointed to be his compliance monitor or worksite monitor. He hired and fired this person and he sent this person to go to AA meetings for him and sign it. And there was no way for the board or the program at the med board to know whether this was on the up and up. I guess what I'm concerned about is, is whether the LAP program has in fact substantially improved such that it, and or whether other outside monitoring mechanisms can really effectively be used to monitor somebody's compliance with the, the ADP agreement. So I, I think uh, what she's talking about is that the, the treatment program that LAP puts together uh, yeah. can allow for options like AA, that can be a component, but you have to participate in LAP in order to get into ADP. Um, I, I, I know that there may have been some issues somewhere along the line of um, people who have certain objections to things like AA based on uh, religious beliefs or lack thereof and that sort of thing, uh, but a, a, LAP is a component of ADP. The terms of what you do, like your treatment program can be very individualized and AA can be a part of that or other things as opposed to AA can also be a part of that, but that's all individually scripted in your LAP treatment program. So I don't, I can't obviously speak to, um, you know, the specific details of any particular, um, you know, respondent and their treatment program, because that's all customized by ADP for them, I mean, by LAP for them. And that's not something that that the court or OCTC would get involved in, LIP is relied on to, to create that program for them. And I, and I do know that there are some times where the respondent doesn't want to do it and, they, um, and they, they won't sign on to it and then they don't get into ADP. I, I, I think that's sort of a roundabout way of answering your question, but. Yeah, and that's not what I got from the meeting earlier. I, I, was, I, I got that the, the respondent, and if the court approved, could um, go into ADP and be subject to monitoring mechanisms by other than lab. Um, I'm not aware of that. So I, I can obviously, and maybe Judge Roland has had a case that I don't know about, but yeah. I, I'm not aware. I know that LAP pro programs, treatment programs differ, but they, they have to go to, to LAP. So. And does LAP have any standards for like um, frequency of drug testing, your, you know, random drug testing? So I, I can only, I mean, I do know what I've seen is like, you know, it, uh, I, what I have seen is um, it actually varies and it, it tends to be more heavy in the beginning 
um, and then it also tapers off. I do know that um, also the testing that they do um, is often contracted to a, a, a lab corp or whatever. So um, it's not a set schedule. It, it's randomized and it's specifically randomized to, you know, to catch people off guard and to make sure that they don't say, well, I, I can drink on Thursday because I don't have to test again until Tuesday. So right. um, there's a, there's a lab that does it and they have their, their schedule and they, um, they just basically call them and ping them and say, you need to come in now. Um, and so it's not, it's not a set schedule and it's not a set number of days a week. As far as I know, I think that's mostly, um, most, mostly done by the private companies who that's their job professionally. Okay. So, Danny, like if you were making a recommendation to us, what would you recommend? I have a hard time with this one because I think that um, I'm a huge fan of drug courts. I really have seen them be super successful. Um, yet I haven't felt particularly like uh, that enthusiastic about the ADP program um, personally. And so I'm just curious, like, do you feel like it's a really good resource or tool to have that we, because the alternative, I guess, is they're just in the traditional discipline system and there's no support being provided through that system to address the behavior causing the misconduct. Yeah, I, I, I can tell you, um, I'm actually not the biggest fan, um, uh, uh, only because I figure if you want to make somebody go do counseling, you can put it in their probation terms. You know, it's really simple. Have them agree to, 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 to whether it's AA or abstain or, or whatever. That's, you know, we have a system. It's probation. Probation can handle it. I don't know that probation would want to handle it or they'd like me for saying that. Um, but the, it, the same, it has the same benefit that ALDs have, which is the carrot. Um, and the carrot is they sign on to, they've got to, they've got to stick to what happened. Um, and uh, that's a huge carrot. And I, and I will tell you this, um, the benefit that you're going to get out of that um, is the benefit to your court system in the long term when it comes to trying cases. Now, I love trying cases and I don't care whether my case is stiff or whether I try them. I much prefer to go to trial. Um, but stipulations save courts time and money. Uh, they just do, right? They, they save you bringing in the witnesses. They save the judge from having to have a full-blown trial and having to issue her decision in, in 90 days or whatever it is. That's a huge benefit to them. Uh, and it's a huge benefit to us as prosecutors when you get them to sign on the dotted line because you no longer have to bring in the 93-year-old victim and worry about whether the 93-year-old victim is there and is going to die and um, we'll be able to, to, to handle, you know, the cross-examination and that sort of thing. You no longer have to worry about the battle of the experts on a, on a, a trust or a probate case. You know, you no longer have to worry about crazy people who remove your case to federal court or sue you or whatever. Like they have signed, like you, you, the, you have a document, their name is on the bottom and you no longer have to prove that, you know, yes, this was your client. And, and yes, you, you, they did give you a $5,000 check. And no, you didn't return the five thousand dollar check. Like that, um, that's a lot of work, and it's a lot of work for us, and it's a lot of work for the court. I actually think it's even more work for the court than it is for us because I got to do that work in investigations. So anything, any program that you offer that gets them to to sign on the dotted line saves witnesses coming into court, uh, and I think that that's something that you can't dismiss lightly. Um, and the other. And what gets them to sign, what gets them to sign is, oh, I'm going to give you a year versus I'm going to give you six months, right? And they want the six months. So because they want that six months, they sign. Um, and it's, that's a huge, it's a huge carrot that you just wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, we obviously always have the ability to step out a case and say, you know, if you stipulate now before I file charges, I'll give you the six months. If you stipulate now and you agree to treatment program, I'll give you six months. Um, but you know, they may not, uh, they, the, I think if they always, a, a lot of respondents or any kind of defendant is always of the impression that my six months, like if, if I can get six months out of her, oh, I can get 45 days out of the judge. So even if I tell them the case is worth six months, if we go to a, a, a settlement conference, or if I go to, uh, if we get into ADP, 
um, they have the opportunity to argue, well, that lady, she wants six months, but I want 30 days. And if I do this for you, you can give me my 30 days. So um, I think that there's always the perpetual problem that they always think that there's a better deal out there and that the judge will always give them a better deal than I will. So um, you have this, you know, program where again, you know, you want to, you want the judge to give you your 30 days. Well, sign on to what you did, say what you did, enter the stick, right? Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest benefits of both of these programs. So Julie, Ira, Kim, how, how are you feeling about this one? I would say if we're gonna use this process, if we want it in ADP, I struggle with the mechanics too of would we do this through our hearing pan through our panels, not the state bar court, because the rest of our discipline system is not using state bar court. Um, and would we then assess an LAP fee on the paraprofessionals, which we haven't talked about? But where, where are you guys on this one right now? Oh, all right, so in, uh, in the state bar system, it's the judge who, who orders the ADP event. I mean, correct? Is that right, Danny? Yes, so in the state bar system, the judge orders the ADP. All right, so that- Sometimes over our objections. It's a little inconsistent with our, I mean, we'd have to fit that into our, our scheme of things. Uh, are four levels right now. It doesn't quite fit right now, does it? Um, well, I, actually, I don't remember if it does. All right. What do you mean our four levels, Ira? Maybe I don't the, uh, the the uh, the diagram we have. Sorry, the the uh, oh, this first is... two levels are the the, the office of uh, trial counsel, and uh, and then we get to the you know. Is that it? Yeah. It would almost have to go Blue to the statute. Yeah. But actually, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. Sorry. <laughs> Kim or um, Julie? Yeah, I, I'm struggling with a little bit with it too and wondering if maybe it's something that gets brought in later uh, too almost. Maybe we go through and say they have to go through the discipline process um, because we have them and I guess if we did do it, it would go potentially to that staff adjudicator to review. Is that where we would? Yeah. Right. It could be an uh, or the panel or the right. panel. Yeah, it could fit in. I, I think I all right now I do have <laughs> a feeling about it. Um, I just remember that we're going to be. It looks like we're going to be starting out with a pilot program, and there's a subcommittee working on that. So, um, given that, I think I favor using ADP and seeing how it works out. I mean, it might not even come up in the pilot program because there might not be a person who fits the criteria, but I can't see any downside for trying it. Well, maybe I can, but I, I, I don't see much of a downside for trying, including it in the pilot program. Well, Ira, I think, you know, we haven't talked about this yet as part of the pilot discussions, but that's true. We're already struggling with whether or not to even pilot the licensing requirements. I'm pretty positive we're not going to stand up this full discipline system during the pilot phase. Um, oh. So I'm just not sure. I don't know what we would. I don't. I don't think it's during the pilot. I guess I would say I don't think it's during the pilot that we're going to get sufficient data to tell us if ADP yeah, right. should be employed. Um, so if it, 
let's just looking at this chart, I think we're going to cross out diversion because I think we're deciding we don't have diversion that's separate that citation and fine. We've got a citation and fine. We're getting rid of ALDs, which is somewhere on this chart. And um, Danny, in an ADP situation, and is an NDC always filed first? Always. Okay. So you'd still have an NDC, and then it's like if the if the paraprofessional applied for ADP, that would happen up in that first green row somewhere. Oh. Yeah, because the NDC is going to be filed. And then the paraprofessional could apply for participation in ADP. They'd, they'd file something perhaps with the hearing panel or just with the staff adjudicator in this model. They'd, they'd file an application or go over and enter into a contract with LAP and you would handle it that way. I think if you wanted to use this model and have an ADP program. Um, uh, Danielle, um, you, you, you said something about uh, why not just have something like uh, ADP as part of probation and do away with the alternative discipline. Uh, what I mean is why not have LAP as part of uh, probation? Um, uh, what would be the difference is it, if, if, uh, substance abuse treatment or LAP or some other treatment were simply part of probation as opposed to being part of ADP is the one difference of whether uh, there's a record uh, of, of something or other uh, at the end? So no, I mean, I, I, presuming if you just added, added LAP as a part of your probation conditions, it's not like we would ever make a, a by statute, you know, your participation in LAP and your LAP records are confidential. So um, that you would no more share the details, you know, of, of your LAP participation. No, I um, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting, but uh, okay. I mean, does, does ADP result in more, less public uh, discipline or, or, or no. sanctions than probation would? You mean less, a lower level of discipline or the information being less public? Lower level or less public. So it doesn't, it's not less public, uh, no matter like whatever. You, I mean, if you get, if you get a private approval at the end of ADP, it's still a public private. So it's still going to show up on the website. The, the charges are public. None of that will ever go away just because you participated successfully in ADP. You know, will you get a lower level of discipline? Yes. And again, like for us, that's a that's a statutory limitation. If you wanted to take away the ability to get a lower level of discipline based on participation in ADP, you'd have to amend the LAP statute. So we're, that's, you know, right. that's, it's a, it's a ledge change, right? If that's what you, the, the way you wanted to go. Um, but as far as just, you know, so you, for us, we have that difficulty, right? We can simply say, yeah, you know, I'm going to give you six months, sign the step or at the end of trial, whatever, whatever it is, and the judge can order, you know, you participate in LAP, but we have this problem that we have a statute that says that that should be, you know, given consideration in your, your disciplinary case. So, um, but if you, if you wanted to do it, you, you could, you could simply do away with, um, with, uh, it, you could not have it and just say, well, you know, we think the reason that this person uh, failed to perform was because they had an alcohol problem. So we're going to order them to, to abstain and to submit the testing and to participate in whatever, you know, the paraprofessional's version of, of LAP is. Or if you get, again, you get a ledge change that says LAP can be extended to non-lawyers, you could do that as well. You're saying that, that ADP results in a lower level of discipline than probation can result in? Right, so because if you do a standard discipline, either by a trial and a decision or a STIP, you have already decided the level of discipline. It's six months, it's, it's, it's you know, 20 months, whatever it is, it's, it's a private. Um, if I enter into a stip with somebody, we've agreed that it's six months. If you go to trial and you have trial at the end, the, the judge has said it's six months, right? And at that point, then they're ordering you to participate in ADP or, or in LAP. 
So that your participation in that program at that point is not going to change your level of discipline. But in ADP, if you do ADP, if you do it correctly, in theory, you know, a case that's worth a year will go down to six months or something like that, right? That's, that's the carry. Uh, given that, I favor having, uh, um, having ADP in our system. Okay. It's 1130. I want to be mindful of people's time. I did create one slide. Did you get that, Linda? Did I send it to you? Um, just for us to go over where we are. Danny, um, thank you. And you don't have to stay on. You know, I just, if, if Julie, Ira, and Kim can stay on for two minutes, I just <clears throat> want us to look at all of our outstanding things we need to do. Did I send you that, Linda? You didn't. Oh, okay. You sent me a message this morning saying you didn't have it ready. So I did, and then I didn't. <clears throat> Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny, Thank so much. Is she still here? I think she's gone. This is all really um, tough. <laughs> Nothing simple. So let me try to pull this up. It is tough, and I'll, I'll just uh, confess my bias on all of these programs. Um, and I don't, I don't like either the LAP diversion program or the, and I've never understood the ADP program at all. I don't understand how there's an incentive to, to go into it. Um, and I, it's not because I don't have sympathy for people with substance abuse problems. Um, it's because I have looked in depth at the actual functioning of these monitoring programs, and they are lame. They are absolutely lame. And, um, and, and I can't tell you the number of times that it's not just medical board, there's other boards whose staff act like freaking cheerleaders for these programs. And the very next day, the front page of the LA Times includes a, a series on how bad these programs are at actually monitoring substance abusing healthcare professionals. And, and it's just horrifying, you know? And you don't know who to believe. And that's why you need to have independent audits and verification of, so that you know who to believe. So, so I'm, it's not that I'm not sympathetic with people who have problems and who are trying to recover. It's not that I think these programs have never helped anybody. That's not true, they have. But, but it's too, they're all too easy to game by somebody who just wants to game it, bide their time, get out. Continue practicing, continue using because they're not monitored correctly. So that's- Do you, do you know of any, um monitoring programs that do a good job at monitoring? Well, that's what was attempted by way of these uniform standards. Uniform standards were supposed to result in uniform standards to be used by all healthcare boards in the Department of Consumer Affairs in 16 specific areas. Like how often do you get a random drug test? And what does that mean? Um, how, what, what happens when you commit a major violation of your uh, of your agreement. Um, th there were never any standards in any of, any, any of these 16 areas at, by any board in the department. And, and so these standards were form formalized, I want to say in around 2010, 2011, the extent of compliance with those standards by these boards and their diversion programs is still a problem because you don't have monitoring um, that I that I know of, um, and as well, Danny said, and I'm sorry to keep about blabbing here, but but as Danny said, many of the DCA boards that have these programs, they they farm them out to a, a company, a pri private company, to administer. And as far as I know, the private company is doing pretty well. They've actually been audited a few times in the last five ten years, which is new and good, um, but. Um, problems can still happen. Um, and, and I've just never, the answer to your question is no. I've never seen a program that is effective at monitoring. Even those private companies, as far as you know, they're not effective. They're not good? No, I'm not saying they're not good. No, not effective, not effective. Oh. <clears throat> At monitoring. The private companies work off of standards that are set by each individual board. 
as far as I know. Is that right, Kim? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, well, it's in a contract with that that um, program. Yeah. And again, those are built off, you know, in the future, built off the uniform standards. So, right. um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's gotten a lot better since they know that they have to be monitored and since they do have the standards. I, I don't know, Leah, for your ADP or your LAP program, who, who runs that? You know, as far as, because that was really the medical board's issue is it was run by civil service employees. It wasn't we didn't have the ability to have like a program like like some of the other boards have this outside monitoring program. So who runs it is um, the ADP program, which has been broken out organizationally in the state bar from LAP and moved into the office of probation. So there are staff there. There are a couple of staff clinicians and they are in the office of probation and they run it. Now they run it with contracted services. It's not like they're providing treatment services directly. Um, so I, it's, it sounds to me like we're gonna come back to LAP, but what I wanted to put up was everything that's outstanding and sort of my recommendation for how we're gonna proceed. Um, so one, we've got this UPL issue and it keeps coming up also in regulation. And my suggestion is that we do a joint meeting, bringing back the LADA person and, and the state bar folks really to brainstorm. Here are recommendations we wanna make as a work, you know, for the full working group to consider for improvements to UPL enforcement, it's, it is slightly outside of the scope of our working group, but it keeps coming up. And so my recommendation is we do that and we, we do that at some later date. Then we've got the public records issue, which we obviously didn't get to today, but I'd like for us to commit to having a recommendation on that for the February meeting. The appellate hearings, I don't, I, I know we talked about that at the January working group meeting. I don't remember what was decided, if it was the paraprofessional board or the panel. So I, I just next meeting, or if you guys, if you all remember what the decision was, maybe you can just tell me, but uh, disciplinary standards. So that's the document Danny was referring to. Ira, you pulled it up. They need to be developed. My recommendation is that staff does a draft and that we reconvene this subcommittee after the April meeting of the working group because between February and April, we've got to turn to housing, consumer debt, all of the other practice areas. We got to get those nailed down. So let give staff a couple months. We'll develop a proposal, look at it again in April. Um, mandatory fee arbitration, I'm gonna bring forward that expert to you to talk about and so we can have that as part of the February recommendations. Compensating and training for panel members, also recommending staff develop a proposal that you consider after the April meeting. And then here we are, we've been down here today. Citation of fine, the ALD, ADP is not on here, but all of this other stuff that we resolve that for February. So I think this is all of the to do's and I'm kind of proposing we put things on different tracks and really focus in our next couple of meetings on what we need to um, uh, develop recommendations around for the February meeting. Does this work for you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think we should start with public, the public records issue. Next meeting. Okay. Instead of wrapping up LAP, I oh. guess I, I read, you seem to be in favor of having an LAP option, Julie not, and Kim, I would say not, at least not initially. No. Um, Given what I, what, what Julie uh, uh, just said about the monitoring, uh, I think I'm not in favor of it now. I keep changing, but uh, if it doesn't work very well, and it's then, really confusing because it does work well in drug courts. Yeah, it's a model, but it, it works. It can work really well. That's the oh. thing. It, it can, but these boards, they're the, the there's huge programmatic implementation issues that are hidden, and boards aren't interested 
general, the board, gov the governing boards aren't interested in those, those details. I would suggest we go on public disclosure, public records issues, because I don't think when we start this program off, we're going to have either an ADP or a LAP, but we should um, be able to say what's going to be public and what's not coming out of a discipline system. All right. Well, based on what Julie just said, though, I mean, if, if that's the thought, we've almost closed that out for your, your group, Leah, right? Because we, I think we think that there should be a citation and fine, no diversion, um, ALD not to start with, and it sounds like ADP and LAP. I think Ira is the only one. I, I mean, I'd be okay with not starting the program with those. Um, so Ira, I guess it would be however he feels about that, right? I go along with what you're saying. Okay. So yeah, then I think we're done. We're yeah. done with that one. Next meeting, we'll turn to public records. Leah, could you send us that, what's on the screen now? Yeah, I will. All right. When is our next meeting? I'm sorry. I'm sure it's in a few days. <laughs> no, but I'm sure it's not. I'm sure it's next it's week. tomorrow. No. <laughs> February 3rd, I think. <laughs> Which is next Wednesday. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. You guys I'm about to send out an, uh, a calendar that shows all the meetings actually through April, including the ones that are about to be scheduled. Oh, we're <laughs> housing, Julie. We're back on. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. All right. I to get those birds for our next meeting. Too. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice, wasn't it? <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Have a nice. great day. Thank right. you. Bye. Thank you.